Welcome to Catonsville United Methodist Church at Home. I'm Jeff Darcy, a fellow member of Catonsville UMC. And while Pastor David completes a period of recuperation, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to lead you in worship today. In John 1.14, we read, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. As we ponder this almost inconceivable gift of God's only Son made flesh for us, let us join in together in a song of worship. Thanks again for joining us today for Worship at Home. We especially want to welcome anyone who might be joining us for the first time. If you're not joining us from the Catonsville area, it might be fun to put in where you are joining us from in the comments section attached to this video. You can also visit our, wait, our website at catonsvilleumc.org where you can sign up for email news, give online, or submit a prayer request. Last week, we commemorated Ash Wednesday, a dual encounter where we face our own mortality and confess our sins in a community of faith while we focus on the two themes of sin and death in the light of God's redeeming love through Jesus Christ. Ash Wednesday begins our annual Lenten journey, leading us to a renewal of faith. Let us continue in that journey as we hear a, hear a song from our choir.
Amen. And thank you for the choir for always doing such a wonderful job. And now let us join in prayer. We'll begin with a prayer that we'll display on the screen. God of the living, through baptism, we pray pass from the shadow of death to the light of resurrection. Remain with us and give us hope that rejoicing in the gift of the spirit who gives life to our mortal flesh, we may be clothed in the garment of immortality through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us continue to enter into God's presence through a moment of silent prayer. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray that you would empower your church through the Holy Spirit, root us in truth, and mobilize us for mission. We pray for the speedy, efficient, and equitable rollout of the vaccine. We continue to ask that you hear and answer our prayers for the healing of our land and us from the ravages of this terrible pandemic. We lift up the countries of France, Germany, and Luxembourg, we thank you for their rich history, their friendly relations, especially in light of the terrible world wars, and for their interfaith work in spreading the good news throughout the world. We pray that you would help them in overcoming any fear and suspicions that may linger from the atrocities of the 20th century. We pray that their churches and governments would care for and protect refugees, as well as the poor and the underserved. Lord, I ask that you continue to watch over us. Heal us and our land, both of the sicknesses within and without. We pray for those who are close to us, who suffer from illness, from mental distress, financial difficulties, and all manner of maladies. And now we pause for a moment to pray silently for those closest to our hearts. Now I ask that we all join together and we pray in the words that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today we continue with the sixth message in our sermon series called Rooted, where we're working through a set of questions and answers about the Christian faith. And today we have a guest to continue our rooting series on the question, why did the Son of God become human? Reverend Dr. Mark Gorman is a United Methodist elder and a lead pastor at the West Hartford Community Parish. So let's prayerfully prepare ourselves for the message we are about to receive. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Savior. My name is Reverend Mark Gorman and I am the lead pastor at the West Hartford Cooperative Parish in Hartford County. It is my privilege to be among the saints of Catonsville United Methodist Church in these strange times. And I look forward to a day when you and I might get to meet each other face to face. In the meanwhile, I trust that the Holy Spirit is binding us together in the love that has been poured into our hearts for the sake of Jesus Christ. Our reading today from Scripture comes from 1 John chapter 3. Hear these words. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Speak your word in our midst, O Lord, either through me or in spite of me, that in all things we may hear with joy what you have to say to us this day. Amen. Unless you know Jesus as the Son of God, you cannot know what it means to be a child of God. Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. We don't say that word too often outside of Advent and Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. That is who Jesus Christ is. That is how Jesus comes to be among us. Not just as a great human teacher or prophet. Not just as someone with an important message. No, Jesus comes to be among us as the Son of God, not by title or some strange metaphor for his deep religious connections, by nature, just in being who he is. Jesus is the Son of God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, as we confess in the Nicene Creed, or in the simpler and perhaps more familiar words of the Apostles' Creed, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. It is God the Son who comes to dwell among us, who takes on our human nature as thoroughly as you and I bear it. Now, these days, we Methodists aren't always very good at the reverence and the awe that are, that just should be part of what it means to be Christians. But that's not our heritage. <laughs> Charles Wesley, John's brother and one of the co-founders of Methodism, once wrote of God the Son among us in this way. Being's source begins to be, and God himself is born. God himself is born, Wesley writes. <laughs> Think of that. That is who Jesus Christ is for us and for our salvation. Worship him. Fall down at his feet. Learn the holy art of reverent silence before him, before this tremendous mystery of our faith. Yes, the Son of God is the Son of Mary. We sing this at Christmas, but do we hear ourselves? Or do the words tumble across our lips without us even noticing them? Do we recognize that in Jesus Christ, the Son exchanges the glory and majesty of God to live among us, for us? That Jesus is the Son of Mary so that we might become the children of God. Unless you know Jesus as the Son of God, you cannot know what it means to be a child of God. If you scan the pages of the New Testament, you will find children everywhere from the birth of the child Jesus to his insistence that children should be welcomed because the kingdom of God belongs to such as them. From Paul's great words in Romans chapter 8 about us being given the spirit of adoption to his chiding of the Corinthians for their spiritual immaturity in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But in his first epistle, John takes this word children and moves it to the center of things. The word is everywhere in 1 John John writes to us as my children and even little children. In fact, he uses the word 14 times at least in this fairly short letter. But what's really important about this is that John writes his letter to us children as a child himself. John, in other words, isn't the head of the household. He is the elder brother, maybe, but he is not the parent. John knows that we, his audience, are children for the same reason that he, the writer of the letter, is a child. Because we are children of God. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. I don't know about your family, but I grew up calling my mom's best friend, Aunt. 
My children actually do the same thing with one of my dearest friends. But every once in a while, when I was a kid, I'd have to explain to someone, well, I call her aunt, but she's not really my aunt. She's not related to me by blood or by marriage. She's my mom's best friend. Sometimes I still have to give that explanation, though not as often these days. But that's not how things are with God. We aren't called children of God the way I call my mom's best friend, aunt. As if we weren't really God's children. No, John assures us the love of God the Father is so great that we may be called the children of God, and that is what we are. There's a great anthem written by the Scottish composer James Macmillan for baptism that takes its cue from 1 John 3. The words are this, Think of how God loves you. Think of how God loves you. Think of how God loves you. He calls you his own children. And that is what you are. This is what Jesus Christ accomplishes for us by coming to dwell among us. The Son of God becomes the Son of Mary so that we might become children of God. And by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, that is what what we are. But without Jesus, and unless we know Jesus as the Son of God, the story is very different. If you read on in 1 John 3, you'll find a sharp change from the comforting language about being children of God. Very soon, John starts talking about sin and lawlessness, and then he introduces some very different language, not about being children of God, but about being children of the devil. Understandably, that kind of language makes us shift in our seats a little. John is writing to a community that is under threat from division and vicious teachings, and it can be uncomfortable to listen in on the heated rhetoric he uses to drive home his point. But that point is crucial. Without Jesus, we have no claim on God. Sin divides us from each other, and it divides us from God. Sin cuts us off from being God's children. In sin, we turn away from God and curl in upon ourselves. And that is the difference between Jesus and us. Jesus just is the Son of God by who he is. And we are the children of God by who Jesus is. That doesn't mean we are less authentic, that we are somehow less God's children. It means that God is more. It means that God's love is so great that even we, even you and I, may be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Jesus, the Son of God, makes his home among us so that we may be God's children. We neither earned this nor did anything to deserve it. In any way, it is pure gift, God's gift to us, to call us and make us his children. But it is a very particular gift. It is a gift of life, eternal life even, as John's gospel makes clear to us. That gift of eternal life, that gift of being called and made God's children is for us to live, not just to wait, but to live. John says we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And those who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. There is more to come of this gift, more of this life, and that has not yet been revealed, except that we know we will be like God, for we will see him as he is. But the gift of life for us is to live as God's children now, not just when the waiting is over. So we purify ourselves, just as he is pure now. So we live now, 
Now, especially at the beginning of Lent, we turn our backs on sin and evil. We renounce them and all the ways of the devil because we have been called children of God. And that is what we are. We turn away from sin and evil and we turn toward God, not by thinking positive thoughts about God, but in how we live, in what we do, in following the commandments of God, especially the Ten Commandments, in living according to Jesus' teaching, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. If we are alive to Christ, Paul says, then we are dead to sin. But John warns us just a few verses later in 1 John 3 that whoever does not ab love abides in death. Living as children of God means being alive in Christ, means that there is, dare we say it, a family resemblance between Jesus and us, between his life and our own lives. Now we are alive in Christ as children of God. How many lives have been devastated by the blow of that terrible question, who do you think you are? In the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, the great singer Odetta cried out, If anybody asks you who you are, who you are, who you are, if anybody asks you who you are, you tell them, I'm a child of God. Who do you think you are? Spiting the devil and all his ways. Who do you think you are? Putting your whole trust in Christ and none other. Who do you think you are? Living like you've been born of water and the spirit. Who do you think you are? Bearing the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who do you think you are? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Who do you think you are? You are a child of God because Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. We're grateful for the gift of your time, talents, and God's message which we received today through your teaching. Now, let us continue with our rooted series tradition of professing our faith. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I pray that you go from this time of worship in the peace of God. Should you feel moved to continue in worship or to receive prayer, Donna and I would love to have you as our guest in the Catonsville United Methodist Church virtual prayer room, which is open from noon every Sunday. We would really love to share the love of Jesus Christ with you through the act of prayer. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you. Go in peace.